I'm on the mainland of Orkney and I've just come over the brow of a hill and I'm looking down at a thin strip of land between two bodies of water, a sea loch and a freshwater loch. And what I'm looking at is a World Heritage Site. And where I'm going is the most exciting new Neolithic archaeological site for generations, the Ness of Brodgar, a place only discovered half by accident 20 years ago. It has profoundly deepened our understanding of, of society, of culture, of life 5,000 years ago. And I'm there to meet Nick Card, for whom this has really become a life's work. He was there from day one and he's still there running the site, running the dig, uncovering building after building. And Stonehenge buildings are pretty rare. We've got lots of monuments, not so many buildings. And he's got tons of them. My name is Matthew McGee, and I was always fascinated by standing stones I came across, wondering who put them there, how come they're still there, and what on earth were they for? Monumentality is, is very much a farmer thing. Someone put these here 5,000 years ago, and they're still here, and that's magical. So I persuaded some experts to meet me at Scotland's most beautiful, interesting and remote Neolithic sites, and got on my bike to go and talk to them by saying, I can make the sun come back and the days get longer again. Let's just build this monument and I'll show you. So and they showed me how much we can learn about the sophisticated, connected, artistic lives of the very first people to give up hunting and gathering and settle down as farmers. Can you describe what the culture was that this was a part of? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is my journey and these are the stories I heard. Welcome to Stone Me, investigating Scotland's oldest places. In this programme, we'll examine the most incredible collection of Neolithic buildings and their precise, beautiful stonework. We'll find evidence that people in Orkney invented a lot of the culture that the Neolithic period is famous for. And we'll find out what further wonders are lurking in that magical Orkney ground. Just coming down a slight hill with the, the isthmus, a little strip of land between the two bodies of water ahead of me. And the, the richness of what's around here is just ridiculous. I've got the stones of Stenes, possibly the first stone circle ever, possibly the source of so much that we'll come to talk about on Stone Me. Uh, passing by my right, we've got the watch stone looming just at the, and the place where you cross over onto that isthmus. Just out of sight, over to my right, is Barn House, a relatively recently discovered settlement. And then up ahead, raised up further down, is a magnificent, enormous Ring of Brogger, the biggest stone circle in Scotland. So this place is just packed. Oh, hang on, that's not right. I have to turn. Yes, that's me cycling right past the site. Dazzled by the majesty of all the stones poking out of the ground, I forgot that my site wasn't much to look at at all. It's all in the ground after all. But I doubled back in time to see a flock of geese land in the Loch of Harry, the freshwater loch to the east of the site. That was the sound of a load of geese landing on the loch. So I'm here at the Nessa Broadgird and we're overlooked almost all the way around by hills so we feel like we're just sitting in a wee natural bowl um, and the sun is shining. It's a mild spring day. The big mountains of Hoy, one of the other islands, uh, just to the west, bathed in sunshine. It's extremely beautiful. It's April, so the site is covered over by tarpaulins held down by tyres. It's only open to the elements for a few weeks each summer while the digging happens. But I've been here before and seen the buildings close up, and I can make out the outlines and shapes beneath the sheets. 
This is a site that's taken the Neolithic world by storm. Yet 20 years ago, it was just a field. My name is Nick Codd. I'm the director of the excavations at the Nessa Brodger. I work for the University of Highlands and Islands Archaeology Institute and also I'm chair of the Nessa Brodger Trust. Well, it all started on a very wet, wild day back in uh, 2003 when the lady who used to live in the house behind us uh, was washing her dishes at the sink and she noticed the tractor was ploughing this field but the plough had stopped because a large stone had become stuck in the plough. So she went out for a look and uh, this large stone slab was obviously man-made. It had been kind of altered by the creation of large uh, notches on one side and one the other edge had been beautifully rebated. So she, they called in the archaeologists and I remember distinctly Julie Gibson, who was county archaeologist at the time, Professor Jane Downs, uh, who's head of the Archaeology Institute, and myself came out for a look. But what they in fact uncovered was the top of a piece of walling, very reminiscent of a very angular, symmetrical architecture we see at the neighbouring site of barn house and structure too. So this got us very excited because only the previous year, this field, these two fields had been geophysics as part of the World Heritage Geophysics Okay, program. technical talk sure break. I'll be interrupting from time to time to explain some terms if they're ones that I had to go away and look up. A geophysics analysis is an attempt to survey what's under the ground without digging so that you can focus expensive archaeological digs on the areas most likely to give you results. It uses magnetism, electrical resistance and radar measurements to give you a rough picture of what big structures lie beneath the surface. Back to Nick. Part of the World Heritage Geophysics Programme and it showed that the whole of the tip of the peninsula was just covered in geophysical anomalies, rectangular ones, square ones, concentric ones, you name it, we had it. But as is ever with geophysics, it's sometimes very difficult to interpret so you really had to put spade to ground and see whether this piece of Neolithic walling, how it related to all these other anomalies. And little could we imagine at that stage that in fact this was just the tip of the iceberg and this whole peninsula, the tip of it, this huge mound which stretches oh, it's almost 250, 300 metres long, 100 metres wide, goes from the shore of the Loch Estoness to the shore of the Loch Ahari. It's all man-made and it all seems to date primarily to the Neolithic period. Where we're standing, we're standing on top of perhaps three or four metres of archaeology, and that is all Neolithic indeed. But we're still excavating only about 10% of the site. You could spend the next 100 years excavating here and still probably not get to the bottom of it. The whole landscape, because we've done a major geophysics programme that now extends all the way from really the, the far skyline, right the way down the peninsula and out towards Mace Howe, and other large areas of geophysics around Scarra Bray, that what you see today is not even the tip of the iceberg. There is so many sites here. For instance, just at the brow of the hill behind the, the, the farmhouse we see up there, there's another very large site we've shown up by the geophysics, and field walking has uh, collected early, uh, Neolithic material there. So that site is even bigger than the Ness but whether in fact it's all contemporary, only excavation can show. So what is the Ness of Brodger? What are we actually looking at? Well, in this trench in front of us, uh, this is our main trench. It gives me a really detailed rundown of the site. It's a collection of beautiful, unique stone buildings of unparalleled size and with incredibly fine carvings that was used and rebuilt over a thousand year period. It was probably a ceremonial place, and the sheer scale of it tells us what a rich spiritual life these people led, and how much material wealth they had to be able to devote resources to building and maintaining a site of this size. How do we know they were rich and showing off? By looking at a recently discovered rubbish heap, or midden. Uh, but that midden mound, it's not just seems to be a rubbish heap, it almost seems to be a, a statement that the Neolithic people were making about what was happening here. Because with these large gatherings of people, we see consumption, conspicuous consumption, on a very, very grand scale. And what that midden heap is reflecting is that consumption. They're almost saying, look at us, this is what's happening here. 
This site has been an absolute treasure trove of artefacts, of tiny fragments of pottery or stone, from which the experts can deduce so much about life 5,000 years ago. We are dealing with sometimes you know, thousands, several thousand finds each season, and all of this has to be sorted. For instance, our ceramic assemblage, which is mainly grooved ware, kind of classic late Neolithic style of pottery, almost like a, a bucket. Um, we have over 100,000 shards of that, the largest assemblage by far of that style of pottery anywhere in the UK. And grooved ware is one of these exceptional uh, types of material which perhaps had its origins in Orkney, maybe at the Ness, who knows, but then spread out and became this kind of pan-British phenomena. So we have the largest array of different types of stone tools, many of them are unique to the Ness, uh, the Neolithic art assemblage, over a thousand examples, by far the biggest assemblage in Britain, if not one of the biggest in Europe, and the list just goes on. But it's not just the artefacts, it's all the ecofacts as well, the, the animal bone that has to be sorted and studied, uh, all the environmental samples which are taken on site. Again, they all have to be processed and then sent off to various specialists to look at the pollen, the carbonized remains, the seeds. So there's so many different strands of the kind of evidence that all have to be woven together to hopefully kind of make this coherent narrative for the site. I'm going to ask the question you'll hate being asked, and people in Neolithic really hate, mm. what, what was it? <laughs> the, the, that is the big question, I think, with so much of archaeology. What was it? How was it used? And the nest, there's no simple answer for that, because the nest was in use for probably over 1,200 years, longer when you take into account the, the Mesolithic activity, the pre-Neolithic activity that we found evidence for here. So over that 1,000 years, the nest wasn't static. Think about 1,000 years in terms of British history. 1,000 years is the same time scale between now and the Battle of Hastings in 1066, roughly. And look at the way how society has changed and developed over the last 1,000 years. Well, the Neolithic was no different. It was a changing, dynamic society. So I think that you know, it, how it functioned changed over those 1,000 years. But I think during its heyday, probably through much of its life, it was a place of gathering. If you want to try and kind of distill it into a few words, it was a place of gathering where people came at particular times of year. Maybe from not just across Orkney, but maybe from much further afield as well. So, so not a village, not a town, buildings used for ceremonial or social use? Yes, I think that uh, when you look at the scale of what we have at the nest, some of these structures, are, you know, you go to Scarra Bray and you look at the size of the domestic dwellings there and compare it to what we have at the Ness of Brodga. Some of these buildings would consume three or four Scarra Bray style houses within them. They are huge. So we think of them more in terms of kind of community buildings, maybe where people came at particular times of year to celebrate particular events. And we have thought that maybe these structures were built by different communities from across Orkney, all wanting the presence to be felt here at the Ness of Brodga, this very, very special place. But then again, we're starting to maybe see how some of these buildings had different functions. So there's lots of questions, and it's only through the post-excavation analysis that, that we can really start to unpick how these structures were used. And did they, did they just walk away, or did they destroy, actively destroy buildings or how, how did the end come? Well I think it, was, it wasn't just an overnight process, I think this was ongoing over several generations possibly although the big bone deposit that we see being placed around Structure 10 seems to have been part of a major feasting event which maybe was there to commemorate the Ness as it had been but also maybe to celebrate a new beginning changes happening in society with the introduction of Bronze Age uh, Chalcolithic type material but um, I think it's, it's no easy answer again about what happened at the end. But what we do see is that some of the buildings are dismantled, some of them are almost levelled, uh, but also they're filled in with layers of midden and rubbish and you know, collapse in the buildings, but also vast amounts of midden material seems to have been deliberately placed. So it's almost like, like they're trying to destroy the, the memory of the nest. So... Uh, it's a difficult question and hopefully more post-excavation will kind of enlighten us there. We've learned so much about Neolithic culture from Orkney. 
If there's a Rosetta Stone for decoding Neolithic culture and society in Britain and Ireland, then Orkney is it. The stone tools found here that come from the island of Arran in southwest Scotland, or the axes from stone quarried in northern England, or the designs and architecture based on those in the Boyne Valley in Ireland, they show us how interdependent Neolithic people were. They sought each other out. They created enough of a common culture that they could gather together in rituals and ceremonies based on a shared spirituality. They copied each other and then went home to bolster their status by bringing art, style, objects and techniques to their own communities. And perhaps simply because Orkney buildings were made in stone and not wood and so the material survives. Or perhaps because it was particularly wealthy. Or maybe because its sea location at the tip of Britain made it easily reachable. For whatever reason, Orkney always appears to be at the centre of any consideration of Neolithic culture in this part of the world. Can you describe what the culture was that this was a part of? No. <laughs> I, um, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, well, you can generalise, but I think what you've got to start doing is trying to unpick going to particular areas, particular, you know, like Orkney as a whole. Uh, and then try to relate it elsewhere. Uh, we found material here from, uh, for instance, pitchstone, a type of volcanic glass from the island of Arran, down the southwest coast of Scotland. We found an axe blank, which probably came from the, some of the great Neolithic axe factories in Langdale in the Peak District. Uh, a lot of the art, the ideas sometimes are just as important as the actual direct evidence, but some of the art here is only comparable to what you find in Ireland. So there's lots of ideas and probably people moving around. But it just emphasises that connectivity across Britain, that uh, I think it was very much a maritime society and the ideas not, necess- not necessarily moving across uh, the, the land, but ideas and material being transported by water. And so we think maybe at certain times of the year or certain festivals, people would have travelled from... Aaron from the Western Isles, from England all the way up to here for ceremonies? Is that, is that one possibility? That's one possibility. I think there's many different ways of interpreting that. That you know, How did that pitch stone, for instance, get from Aaron up here? Was it just a single direct route or was it traded, exchanged up the West Coast between communities? But having said that, I think that we are seeing you know, material, so much foreign material being uh, brought to the nest that you do wonder that uh, the nest was maybe a pilgrimage site and its kind of status, its significance was known not just across Orkney but much, much further afield. I think Orkney was a special place but as was portrayed in a BBC series a few years ago, Orkney being the the capital of Neolithic Britain is a total misnomer, total non-starter. Well, Neolithic capital or not, Orkney experienced the same massive flowering of art and culture that's a hallmark of this period. This moment when we settled for the first time as farmers wasn't the first time that we made monuments in stone or etched patterns into pots, but something happened 5,000 years ago that resulted in the use of decoration and craftsmanship to create objects whose beauty shines down through the millennia. Maybe it was the settling that did it, the fact that through farming we could generate a surplus and so have food available for people who didn't work in the fields, but who laboured over stone, antler and pot. And there aren't many better places to see the outcome of this than the Ness of Brodker. Um, At the Ness we find incised and pecked designs uh, on many of the walls of the buildings, so we find big architectural piece of stone that had been decorated, usually with with just very simple geometric designs. But um, this is kind of reflected on the, the, the art, the, the decoration you see in pottery. And at the Ness, we're discovering many new types of designs, but also the use of colour in those designs as well, whether it be in the pottery or indeed the walls of these structures. Well, I think some of the, the, the houses, some of the domestic structures you see in Orkney have very, very fine architecture. But at the Ness, they seem to take that to a different level. Structure 10, which was the, the kind of last, the biggest, the grandest building, when it was first built, it must have been one of the, the finest pieces of architecture, not just in Britain, but in Northwest Europe. The use of different coloured sandstones, the use of uh, standing stones in a kind of very ornate entranceway, the scale of the larger central chamber, 
the amount of art that was discovered from it, but also the, the stonework is just immaculate. Little imperfections in the stones being removed, stone being brought from many different locations across Orkney. But even some of the earlier structures, the ones that we saw quite terms so-called peered structures where they have these kind of stone piers uh, projecting from the inner wall faces to, to create kind of recesses along the, the inner walls. Some of those are so fine, it's just jaw-dropping. Some of the stone work that we find here is only comparable to what you might see in Mays Howe, the finest chamber tomb in northwest Europe. And in fact, one of the structures, structure 27, uh, in the, the trench on the far side of the site, um, it's even, you know, in some ways, more special. Last year, although most of the stone had been robbed out in prehistory, we have uncovered one of the outer wall faces, and the stonework is the finest I've ever seen in a Neolithic context in the UK. But it's also the techniques that we're using in that structure, where the inside was actually clad in upright stones, orthostats, that were partially held in place by massive, uh, almost standing stones placed on edge. Over, some of them over four and a half, getting on for five metres long. So again, it's a unique style of architecture. But I think when you look at the nest itself, it's the scale of what was happening here. That when you think about the, the implications of what the Neolith Neolithic population might have been like, but what they were doing here, it's not just, for instance, a consumerism of huge amounts of food materials, but also kind of the building materials they were using. Tens of thousands of tons of stone had to be quarried, transported here, and then constructed into these wonderful buildings. But also the use of stone on the roofs, stone tiles, and by implication, large amounts of timber must have been available. I think most of that would have came from the seed as driftwood, but it's still kind of the logistics of the site. We knew that, you know, you're looking at some of the stone circles like the Ring of Brodgood to actually excavate the ditch, put up the standing stones, etc. takes a lot of person power. But the nest, it think, takes that to a different level, different magnitude of accomplishment. As Nick suggests, the Ness has led to some fairly excitable claims about it and Orkney in the Neolithic period. It's undoubtedly important, but Nick says it's deepened our understanding of the period rather than turned it on its head. Well, I think it probably hasn't overturned much, but what it has is emphasised that you know what we, how we view the the, the Neolithic, um, what they were capable of. When you look at it's not just the Ness; it's the whole kind of landscape. It, further excavation, for instance, at the Ring of Brodga and several other Neolithic sites in Orkney, never mind the multitude of other Neolithic sites being excavated elsewhere in Britain. So it's bringing all that evidence together that is really kind of changing our views about how this, how dynamic this society was. But in the Ness, for instance, it has been suggested that the Ness has kind of flipped the map of Britain on its head and that you know, rather than being a southern centric uh, society that in fact Orkney was very very important and you know we see things like the groove where pot pottery perhaps originating up here and also the idea of henges stone circles may have started up here and then spread out across Britain. There is one charge against Orkney that its archaeology gets disproportionate attention and funding because of an accident of building materials People here built in stone, not in the wood of the Cursus Monuments or Longhouses further south, because they had access to the local easily split, easily worked stone, and also probably because there were fewer trees here than elsewhere. That means that more structures survive here, so there's more to look at now. But we mustn't necessarily read that as meaning that this was the most important place 5,000 years ago. Is it a danger that we're painting a picture of Neolithic politics and society that's distorted by the fact that wood rots away and stone doesn't? Do we have a stone bias? Elsewhere in Britain, there is many, many other sites which maybe weren't on a par with the Ness, but I think that uh, there is potential that what you see being built in timber elsewhere, which obviously hasn't survived so well, um, that some of those structures, some of the great longhouses, um, that uh, they were of a par. And when you actually think about the amount of timber that was used in some of those, but also some of the, the, the other timber constructions, um, a friend of mine was talking to me recently about a site he was working on where they, they discovered you know, post holes that probably held tree trunks 
we have in excess of a metre, a metre and a half in diameter. And uh, judging by the depth of the post hole, you may be looking at a piece of timber that was, I don't know, 10 metres high. Trying to manoeuvre that into place is just a biggest, as big an accomplishment as kind of moving some of the stone here. In fact, possibly even more difficult. The Nice of Brodger has brought Neolithic Orkney to life in an incredibly vivid way. Each digging season revealing sensational new objects or structures, forcing re-evaluations of previous theories and prompting new ones. But archaeologists have to balance the drive to dig, to uncover, reveal and share, with the need to cover up, to preserve and protect, knowing that better analysis and technology is coming. The NACE has reached a turning point. Well, sadly, 2024 will be our last season of excavation at the NACE. Um, We've reached a stage where we will have excavated down to the primary floor levels of many of the major structures that have so far been uncovered. But having said that, there's early ones underneath those ones. But there is such a huge volume of uh, post-excavation to do. But sadly, the site will have to be covered over again. Because unlike Scarabray, which is basically made of beach stone, the nest is made from mainly quarried stone. And as soon as you leave that exposed, then uh, it will start to delaminate. So if we left it open within a year or so, one winter in fact, you'd probably be uh, have this vision of just stone chaos here. So it has to be covered over again very carefully. But it will leave it for future generations, maybe better equipped than we are to actually preserve the site. There's been lots of suggestions about maybe building a glass dome over it, but all of that costs huge sums of money and the conservation uh, budget would have to be, you know, several million. When it gets covered over, it, it, it'll just be a, a field, is that right? It'll just be returned to a green field, um, as it was 20 years ago. And, and when that happens, how will you feel? It's, it'll have been over 20 years at that point. Well, the nest has been a big part of my life for, yes, 20 years, um, almost an obsession, some people might say. But um, I think uh, we will have done the best for the archaeology, and the archaeology is a major concern. But I think the nest will still not be forgotten about. We want to keep it there in the, in the, the public's eye, in the academic's eye as well. So we're looking at ways of presenting the site virtually through augmented or virtual reality, uh, maybe with apps so that when people walk by the site, they can look over and see how the site was during excavation, but also as, as it was perhaps thousands of years ago during its heyday. That was incredible. He has such a sense of the, the sophistication of the society, not just the fact that there was travel and exchange of ideas and goods and probably people through intermarrying, but the sophistication of the actual material they were producing. That incredibly precise stonework, the artifacts, the pottery and the invention of invention of whole fields of art, the grooved way or pottery style that then spread all across Britain and Ireland. The stone circle I'm just coming up to again of Stennes just nearby that if it was the first has been so widely and spectacularly copied. And then that sense of mystery still 20 years in. What was going on here? Certainly feasting, certainly ritual, certainly travel possibly a centre of spiritual life for, for life all around Orkney and, and possibly far beyond. We just don't know yet. But it's a privilege to wonder. Join me next time on the Isle of Lewis, the far northwest tip of Europe, at the Stones of Callanish where a celestial light show dances across the horizon between the stones every 18.6 years. And if you'd like to support what Nick and the others are doing at the Nessa Brodker, it's really easy. Just visit the trust that funds and promotes the work at nessabrodker.co.uk forward slash trust or follow the link in the show notes. 
you've enjoyed this programme, then please do share it, or even better, like and review it wherever you get your podcasts. And you can support more programme making by buying me a virtual coffee at ko-fi.com slash stoneme. See you next time on Stone Me, investigating Scotland's oldest places.